Well, Mr. Danabalan, thank you very much for joining us uh, in this conversation today. Let me just first ask you this question. You have been uh, in public service and in private service for about 50 years. How would you describe your management philosophy? How would you say that has shaped your philosophy? Well, for most of my last 52 years of working life, uh, I have not been a leader. I had to be a follower for a long time. Okay? And then it is only in the late 60s that I became a leader of sorts, firstly in the uh, DBS Bank, uh, subsequently in politics, where again I was a follower for a short while before I took on ministerial responsibilities. And then after I left politics, uh, I became chairman of a number of companies. So I would say in every uh, position I've held, I mean, both a follower and a leader. What makes a good follower? What makes a good follower? Uh, be very attentive to what the leader does. Uh, be prepared to stand up to the leader because that partly shapes your own leadership style in the coming years. And uh, basically, apply yourself diligently. So then when you become a leader, do you appreciate those particular traits? In, in the people that you manage? Yeah, you learn new things as you become a leader because you, you have to uh, lead people, you have to motivate them, you have to make them feel comfortable, you've got to uh, make sure that they want to follow you. First of all, very few leaders have no responsibility to someone else. Most of us as leaders, especially in the corporate world, have a responsibility to the board, to the shareholders who actually determine whether we continue as a leader or not. So how do we deliver what the people who appointed us expect from us? The first thing is look for good people to be in your team. I have learned that a leader cannot actually perform without very good people with him. And most often he must get people who are better than him. If the leader is afraid to get people who are better than him, he will never be able to raise the standards in the organization which he leads. So that to me is absolutely critical. And for that, you need to be able to judge people. And the first judgment you've got to make is whether the people whom you take into your team are people of integrity. The technical judgment about their experience, their education, with the ability to deal with situations, that is more easily judged and more easily assessed. What is more difficult to assess is the person's value systems, his sense of integrity, how he'll perform when he's tested. These are absolutely important. And one of the things I've learned is to distrust people who want to produce result, re results at any cost and all costs. People who deal with others for example, their customers or their peers or others on the basis of caveat emptor. I want people who will be able to uh, see that those who deal with them benefit by that relationship, whether as a customer or as a follower or whatever it is. Okay. Uh, such people who are also smart can add to the quality of the team that you lead. You raised a lot of very good, interesting points, and I want to pick out on one of the first ones you mentioned, which is finding the right people. And you spent a lot of time discussing integrity yes. and character. And you said that's one of the hardest things to discern. Yeah. How do you discern it then? I mean, do you, is there any special question, style, or how do you find, how do you get to the core of someone's values? Well, either I select a person or people below me select, but I see them either before they're recruited or even sometimes after they're recruited. In the case of Tomasic, for example, I, I play very little role in terms of recruiting people except for the very top. But I do meet a lot of people. And when I meet them one-on-one, one -on -one, I seldom talk about the business. Most of the time is spent talking about many other things. What are their interests? What do they read? What is their family like? What are their experiences in, li in life? That reveals to me much more about their character and integrity 
than talking about business. Where does this core value or this focus on, on integrity and ethics come from? I mean, is it, is it from what you experienced growing up? Uh, I'm, I'm just kind of curious to get to know a bit behind. You're asking about me personally. If I may. <laughs> you know, because to be honest with you, I, I do interview a lot of corporate leaders and I don't very often hear integrity integrity coming up several times in conversation. Actually, for me, it's very simple. It comes from my faith. I'm a Christian. And uh, I'm a practicing Christian. I study the scriptures for values, for my actions, and I take it seriously. Right. But I'm not overt that I'm doing this because of my faith. But that's where my values derive from. Yeah. And that informs your leadership style yes, and, and yes. your philosophy as well. Yes. Now, as, as someone who you know, joins, let's say, Tomasic or DBS or, or SIA, where you've uh, led the boards in the past, as they rise through the ranks, they become top performers, star performers, so to speak. How do you continue to motivate them? How do you keep them within the fold? How do you keep them interested? Well, it depends on the kind of organization. I think the, the organizations where I've led for the longest time are the Ministry of National Development, the DBS Bank, and Tamasic. As I, I was there just about three years. All right. The institution and organization as a whole must have a system to keep them. And one of the things that I emphasize to heads of units and departments is that you must be prepared to let those who are working below you transfer out. You must be prepared to offer someone for a job who cannot be spared because then the person is going to do well. Okay? And if that person does well and becomes a, subsequently a head of, of another unit, it's a credit to you because you have nurtured the person and you have actually brought the person up. But not everybody sees it that way. Okay? They tend to look at their uh, interests in very narrow terms. So there's a constant uh, education process to get heads of units and, and departments to see that they must be prepared to allow their people to rise beyond and go beyond their own unit. And one of the things about the heads of any units or organization is that dealing with people has to occupy quite a bit of your time. And that many people find difficult because they are more interested in getting the job done, okay? not in nurturing uh, and, and coaching their people. That if you really ultimately want to perform well, you must be prepared to spend time doing that. You touched on an interesting point, and that's the issue of mentoring and how important that is. And I remember reading about a eulogy that you gave for Dr. Go Kang Sui, where you related a story about how when you were in your final year of study at university, the Ministry of Education, which was funding your, your scholarship, wanted you to switch from economics to English literature, I believe. Dr. Go intervened allowed you to stay on in education, and I think the quote here is... Well, uh, um, one of my teachers appealed. Uh, he just appealed, Go. Yes. Dr. Go, and yeah. he helped he out. He did not know me at all, yeah. And uh, you had a quick chat with him, and so you were allowed to stay in economics. And I, I read a quote here, his intervention not only changed my career, but the whole course of my life. Can you talk more about the importance of, of being mentored? as a young professional, and conversely, on the other side, how mentoring plays a crucial role for the development of any, any company. Well, in my relationship with Dr. Goh, as a mentor-mentee, <laughs> right? he was my mentor, um, I found that two things have to happen. One, there were instances where he identified situations where he thought I, I should receive some advice or guidance, even without me asking. Okay. There are other situations where I needed guidance, I went to him. I think a mentor-mentee relationship must be one where both of you have an understanding. So I think there must be that uh, level of comfort and understanding and trust to be able to have the relationship go both ways. Can you elaborate a bit more on how that is really important for the continued success of a company, that people realize I need to sort of mentor this, this junior employee who has a potential in the future, right? The people that I can think of uh, were, were not people who contributed to the better performance of the institution from which they went. But they became, they were successes in their life. They were very successful in their own life because there was an opportunity and I decided that it's good to send them there to pursue the opportunity. 
it was an opportunity in a related company and subsequently as a result of that experience they went on somewhere else mm -hmm. and really became very successful. So the primary uh, uh, interest there was not whether he will become a better contributor to the organization but whether he himself will do better in life. All right. I think to me that is more important. Uh, people who work for you may not work for you for their whole life. But what is it you can do to help them be more successful in their life? No, I'm just trying to say that it sounds to me that this, this view is a very unselfish uh, perspective. It's a very kind of broad, unselfish perspective compared to a lot of the pressures that CEOs and, and chairmen feel right now in terms of performance-driven, mentoring people to stay within the company. And what you're saying is, let's just mentor good people. Well, it, and it comes back in the well, end. Yeah, it, it does come back. It does come back. And uh, especially in Singapore, the society is small, the business community is small, businesses relate with each other. And in Tumasik, for example, we have many people that leave Tumasik and go to other companies. Some are sent by us, some go on their own. And we try to maintain a good alumni network. You see? because it is of great benefit to Tomasic. So if you look at it in that sense, you know, uh, if you have someone working out there, uh, say in an investment bank, who has gone through Tomasic, and then we use the investment bank, obviously the relationship is going to be different because he has been with us, he now knows us, he knows our people, you know, uh, and we know him. Now, if he leaves us because in my judgment, he just pursues money, then I'll be a little bit more careful about dealing with him. All right. Can we just pivot for a moment to the issue of compensation? Because that has really been in the news, especially in the financial sector for the past several years. What are your views on how do you compensate someone fairly and adequately? and in, in, in a way that makes them remain motivated to do their job, but also doesn't break the bank, if I may use a bad pun. Well, I'm really from the old school. I find it quite impossible, incredible, that someone who's getting, being compensated, say, $2 million, is upset because he's not getting $2.5 million. So I, this is something that I find very difficult to understand. Okay? And I think the financial sector, banks, especially investment banks, have completely lost all sense of reality. You know? And that's why we are in the predicament that we are, we are today. And people still don't seem to have learned. In the case of Tumasek, we recruit people from this area of business, people who are investors, investment bankers, many of them, but not all, okay? So obviously, we have, to be, we have to compensate them well. But we have never, in my, in my, if my memory serves me correct, recruited anybody from an institution by paying him more. Usually they come for less. How do you make that so? Not for, when I say less, they don't come cheap, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but less than what they were getting. All right. Well, we motivate them by the challenge of the job, what they can achieve, how they can build up the institution. You know? And of course, working for an institution like Tomasek also brings with it its own prestige. They may be quite, at the end of the day, still money-minded. But as long as the people have integrity, they can contribute, we do take them. But we never offer them more than what they have been getting, what they're getting. To us, that's one of the tests. Because these are already people who are earning very well, very high compensation. They already have a nest egg of some kind. Okay? If they come to us and start talking about money, in our own minds, we will rank them pretty low down. Okay? We want them to come because they enjoy the job, they want to be motivated, they want to build an institution. And that's the kind of people we have fortunately been able to get at the top. You've also gone on record saying that you really are not a huge fan of stock options. What then, what structure then is the best compensation structure, if, if not really stock options? No, I'm a strong believer in the management focusing on the performance of the company, not on the performance in the stock market. 
ultimately the performance of the company will be translated into performance in the stock market. Not always, and not always early enough. Uh, there have been companies where the CEO has done very well in bringing up the core business of the company, but stock market performance has been poor, and the board has removed such CEOs, which I think is very unfair. All right, But obviously, to some extent, you can influence the stock market in the way that you communicate information to them and how you communicate. Okay? Uh, those are things that, those are the types of competencies that the CEO and his team must have. But their primary objective must be to improve the performance of the business of the company. You know? So once they get involved in tracking what is happening in the stock market, they get distracted. That's why I've never been in favor of stock options. Is that something that you also sort of try and get the Tamasic linked companies to, to, to sort of wrap their yes, minds around? Yes, I, internally we have big debates and I've always been against, you know, uh, stock options for both staff and directors. Stock grants is another thing. I am against any kind of compensation system that distracts the management from running the company to seeing what's happening in the stock market. What then do you make of all these uh, examples that we see, especially in the financial sector, and sometimes even outside of, of, uh, of banks and, and finance companies, of top-tier staff getting either top-tier salaries while there are massive restructuring you know, and layoffs going on or the company's underperforming, but the top management still is paid well? Well, if the board is desperate enough to want someone to join and you say, okay, you perform, you get X. If you don't perform, I still give you, you know, a good golden parachute to exit. Uh, they must be in a desperate state to do that. And I will be very careful about recruiting such people. Okay? If I'm on the board of any company, I would never agree to that. Okay? Which may not be realistic, but that's the way I am. You know? What is your personal view on what the responsibilities are of a board and, and how they ensure they get their job done? Well, we in Temasek have evolved over the last 20 odd years. Here we have a system where in all our companies we have a guideline that no more than two executives should be on the board and the CEO should never be the chairman. Right? So the board is almost 80% independent directors. Okay. Boards meet after every board meeting without the CEO, every board meeting. So that we have a far more active board in our companies than in many other companies and in many other places. Okay. So in the case of the banks, where compensation has gone completely awry, I blame the boards. How could they even go to an annual general meeting and say that the company has performed badly but we're giving an increase. When DBS, perform, when DBS performance went down in, uh, during the financial crisis, everybody's salary was cut. Same year. All right? Everybody from the top down, including the chairman, directors, everybody took a reduction. Because that is the only way to convince your shareholders that you are taking into account what, how the company is performing. If you're continuing to compensate people without regard to performance, you just completely lose control. So having rules and regulations uh, f for corporate governance is quite important then? Absolutely. Absolutely. But rules and regulations alone are not, alone not, not enough. You know. You have to have good people on the boards. You know. So what you need, whether, and this is a principle that I'm very careful to adhere to, whether as a leader in where I am today or where I was, or whether you're on the board of a company, you must be prepared to say, I don't want to do it, I'm walking out. You steered, uh, I think it was DBS through the Asian financial crisis. That was a, a regional crisis that most people seem to understand as it was happening. We've got a global crisis going on right now. No one really understands what's going to happen if Greece 
goes bust and leaves the euro. So it seems that the world is moving at a faster pace and there are increasing complexities. And it just seems to me, at least, that for a leader like you and anyone out there today, it's much more complicated than it used to be. You're yeah, well, certainly right, it's much more complicated. Therefore, you've got to get even better people. Mm -hmm. People who understand what's happening in the world today. You know, it, it is not facetious to talk about known unknowns and unknown unknowns. You know, it, when you have scenario planning, you're trying, within the knowledge that you have, put together situations which may never happen, but if it happens, you at least have thought about it. Okay. And then things that you never even thought about may happen. That's where the quality of your people comes in. All right. And that's where leadership also comes in. The leader must never panic. Even if he panics internally, he must never transmit the panic to the team. That's key. Because people must be able to think calmly and rationally. And if they see the top man, the leader, panicking, then they get disorientated. So when the leader faces a situation where he actually does not know what to do, he must not transmit that uncertainty and sense of panic. He, must, he may not say anything very helpful, but he must remain calm mm -hmm. and help his people to think through the situation. Interesting you brought that point because I wanted to bring up the fact that you were actually chairman of Singapore Airlines during the uh, Silk Air tragedy. Yeah. And if I can just ask you, you know, that must have been a, a, a terrible time. Yes, it was. So if you can Every think airline must prepare for it. Through yeah. those first few weeks uh, as it was unfolding, what, what kind of takeaways do you have from that in your experience? What lessons have you sort of learned from that that have informed you as a leader? Well, first uh, of all, uh, the things happened. People have lost their lives. And relatives are completely emotional and irrational. And you must expect that. So you go there. I had, to, I had to face them. Though I was not chairman of the company, I was chairman of the, of the holding company. Silka had his own, own board and own management. But nevertheless, I, I had just been a minister, I finished my cabinet responsibilities. Three years later, I was there, and then a couple of years later, this happened. As far as the families were concerned, they probably still saw me as part of the political leadership, although I wasn't. So I had to be there in front, facing them. And it's very painful because they may say things which may hurt you, but that's not the point. The fact is that they've lost their loved ones. So very often it's a question of just listening, being a good listener, uh, cry with them, you know, and uh, just convince them that you understand a little way what they're going through. So there's a different kind of crisis, you know. So there are companies which may go through that such a crisis, especially a pharmaceutical company where something goes wrong, you know, uh, but not all companies are likely to have that kind of uh, crisis. Can I just ask you, who would you consider your role models? Who do you look to for good examples of leadership? And, you know, uh, for example, I mean, what, Deng Xiaoping, mm. okay. Uh, I'm sure you know, he's seen as a visionary, as, as a leader. Um, you know, Lee Kuan Yew mm. from Singapore. Um, in some cases, you hear in the US right now, you know, people like Steve Jobs for example, may not quite share the same character, uh, values and characteristics that you talked about, but these are names that are out there. So well, I'm just the kind of wondering... People are obviously, whom I work with, of the names that you mentioned is Lee Kuan Yew. Okay? I worked with him for many years. So obviously I know what his leadership style is. And his leadership, leadership style in the team is very different from outside perception. He's not autocratic. He does not say, do this, do that. Mm -hmm. He wants your views. He wants your ideas. And if he has an idea that you are not convinced, he doesn't overrule you. He almost considers it a failure if he has an idea that you don't agree with. Mm -hmm. So 
he tries his best to explain his idea in such a way that you will understand why he has that view or why he, why he wants to do that. He's not the kind of person who thinks, well, I'm the, I'm the Prime Minister, I decide you do. He wants you to, 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 to uh, understand and uh, what's the term that they use? Uh, buy in. Buy in. Okay. And to buy in, he, has, he makes a great deal of effort to make sure that you, you understand his process of thinking, what are the factors he has taken into account, why he's come to the decision which is very different from what people perceive him to be. So he's a great listener, right? And great persuader. Uh, that is something that I, I think I would say, yes, working with him is something that I, I've learned. You, know, you have to listen. So that is something that you must be you know, that's, that's a trait that, that I think is a leader must have. And then just finally, what do you want to be best remembered for? What do you want your legacy to be? No, I, I never think in terms of legacy or best remembered for. I just do my job and get on. Others can come and take what I've done and carry on from there. But you've also had such an, an interesting professional experience. I've had a, you know, yes, and, I've had an, a life, a career, which I never dreamt I would, ha I would have. Okay, so I'm blessed in ways that you know I cannot even understand why I'm blessed this way. Okay, and uh, so I just take it as a great blessing.